Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the lecture series on respiratory physiology. Respiration is best discussed under these headings. Ventilation, which is the process of inspiration and expiration or inhalation and exhalation. Perfusion, which is the phenomenon of blood flow through the lungs, what's called pulmonary circulation. We have to learn the nuances of pulmonary circulation to understand gas exchange better. Diffusion is a process of gas exchange across the respiratory membrane composed of the alveolar epithelium and the capillary endothelium. Then we should learn about how the gases are transported in blood. Oxygen is transported in the dissolved form in plasma as well as in combination with hemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin. Carbon dioxide also travels in the dissolved form as well as in certain other forms as processed by the red blood cells. Ultimately, we have to learn why cells require oxygen and how do they generate carbon dioxide. Traditionally, any lecture series or even textbooks would begin the discussion with ventilation and move downwards. But over the years, I found it easier to convey my concepts better if I start with cellular respiration and move upwards. And that's what we are going to do now. We will start with a discussion on cellular respiration. The question is, why do cells require oxygen? At school, you would have learnt this equation. Glucose plus oxygen gives carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. That is the chemical form in which it is written and that is the balanced equation. Now this equation can be a little misleading because it can make one think that oxygen reacts with glucose to give these products, which is not the case. This is too simplified a form of all those complex reactions that happen in the process which include glycolysis as well as the tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle. However, even if this is an oversimplification again, it is a little better than that other equation. We could say that glucose splits to form carbon dioxide, protons and electrons through a series of reactions in which there is water uptake. This is the carbon dioxide that has to be given off <coughs> and that does not require oxygen for its formation. The protons and electrons, when we come to that, these ele electrons are high energy electrons. They transfer their energy to protons. A proton gradient is build up, built up and that proton gradient can be thought of as important for generation of energy the energy currency within the cell, which is the high energy phosphate bond in the ATP molecule. Now, once this has been done, these protons and electrons have to be removed from the system so that the reaction can proceed that way. We have to remove the products of the reaction and that is where oxygen comes in. Oxygen combines with the protons and electrons to form water. Now, this slightly better form of the equation has morphed to this form because the water is taken off, it is kind of cancelled there and you have six water there. So, there are two steps of the reaction. This is the first step and the second step is where oxygen comes in. This can be thought of as a two step reaction even though it is an oversimplification. This is the first step, those are the products of the first step and oxygen comes in in that next step. But in the simplified form, oxygen is moved to the first step itself. These intermediates are removed and that is how we get this equation. As I said, that can be a little misleading. So what we will see now is how glucose undergoes its reactions, only the major steps we will consider to form these products and how from these we get water and how is energy generated or ATP molecule formed from ADP and an inorganic phosphate in the process. So we could write it better like this. Glucose undergoes some form of hydrolysis, not glucose per se, but the metabolites of glucose to form carbon dioxide, protons and electrons. Protons and electrons react with oxygen to form water and energy. 
Now these are the steps, the major step. Glucose undergoes a series of reactions termed glycolysis where pyruvate is the end product. There is no oxygen required here and this happens in the cytoplasm of cells. Pyruvate then enters the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is a double membranous structure. This is the outer membrane and this is the inner membrane. What you have here is the mitochondrial matrix and this is the intermembrane space. Both these are important in the functioning of mitochondrion. You would have learnt about the electron transport chain which is a series of proteins on the inner mitochondrial membrane which is involved in using the high energy electrons, deriving the energy from them and then do certain things to create ATP molecules. The proteins of this electron transport chain transport electrons along its energy gradient, harvest the energy and use it for synthesis of ATP. How does this happen? Pyruvate gets into the mitochondrial matrix, combines with acetyl-CoA, the process releases some carbon dioxide. Acetyl-CoA along with oxaloacetate undergoes a series of reactions, what are termed as the tricarboxylic as a tricarboxylic acid cycle or citric cycle or Krebs cycle. Water is taken into these series of reactions, carbon dioxide is given out. That is the carbon dioxide which has to be removed, it enters blood and then goes to the lungs. In the process some protons and electrons are formed, how actually are they formed? Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is an intermediary which will enter the Krebs cycle, react with the intermediaries in the Krebs cycle and pull out protons as free protons as well as in combination with itself NADH. It becomes reduced NAD once it reacts with the intermediaries of the Krebs cycle. NADH would again ionize to give you protons, more free protons, free electrons and N regenerate the NAD plus. NAD plus will move into the Krebs cycle again to bring out more protons and electrons. This reaction is catalyzed by complex 1 of the electron transport chain which is indeed termed NADH dehydrogenase. The ionization of NADH to protons NAD plus and the free electrons is achieved by NADH dehydrogenase. It's not as if NAD has a role only within the mitochondrial matrix, even in the cytoplasm the process happens, some NADH is formed during the glycolytic process as well as in this step. However, we will think of how the protons and electrons within the mitochondrial matrix work to give ATP molecules. As I said before, these electrons are high energy electrons. The electrons would first be taken up by NADH dehydrogenase and then be transferred through the members of the electron transport chain one after the other. So it binds to NADH dehydrogenase. When it is transferred to the next protein in the electron transport chain, some of the energy in, of the high energy electrons is released. It goes to a lower energy state when it gets transferred and the energy that was released is used to pump protons out from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. I say pump because as we sh shall see shortly, the proton concentration in the intermembrane space is kept very high because of the pumping action of the members of the electron transport chain. The internal, con the concentration of the protons within the mitochondrial matrix is kept very low and that is why I said pump, it is active transport and the energy for that active transport is directly derived from transport of the high energy electrons across the electron transport chain. So as the electron gets transferred, the energy released is used by the members of the electron transport chain to pump the protons into the intermembrane space. You would have learnt in biochemistry or even in school that ubiquinone and cytochrome C are shuttle proteins which will take the electron from here and give it up here and cytochrome C from the cyto cytochrome C reductase to the cytochrome C oxidase. So now we have a situation where there is 
a very high concentration of protons in the intermembrane space and very little here because all these protons have been pumped out. This is now taken advantage of by another transporter on the inner mitochondrial membrane called ATP synthase. It allows downhill transport of protons along its energy gradient. It is in high concentration here. Within the matrix, it is in very low concentration. Therefore, they are able to move in passively along their concentration gradient through the ATP synthase. However, when they move along their concentration gradient, energy is released and that energy can be thought of as being captured by the high energy bond in the ATP molecule. The ATP synthase is binding sites for ADP and phosphate and as protons move down the energy gradient, this protein literally rotates. You could see videos of how this protein functions on YouTube and the movement of the ATP synthase allows formation of ATP from ADP and phosphate. This is in short how energy is generated in the cell from glucose. We still have not seen where oxygen is required. Now once the protons and electrons have come back into the mitochondrial matrix, they cannot be allowed to accumulate there because that will hinder further reactions. They have to be cleared up from the system and that is the job of oxygen. Oxygen enters the mitochondrial matrix combines with protons and electrons to form water. It clears up the spent protons and electrons which come back into the mitochondrial matrix. If there is no oxygen, then as these molecules build up in the mitochondrial matrix, the reaction cannot proceed further, pyruvate cannot enter, this, enter the mitochondrion any longer pyruvate builds up within the cell, it then gets converted to lactate and lactate moves into the bloodstream. So if you find an excess of lactate in the bloodstream, it tells you that the cells are depending on anaerobic metabolism, probably due to shortage of oxygen. This is the whole thing summarized, where pyruvate enters the cell, you get carbon dioxide electrons and protons and how they generate the ATP molecule and how the protons and electrons are consumed by oxygen to form water. Thank you for your attention.